So thank you so much for joining us here at the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Um, we're really pleased to be able to bring you this event with such incredible speakers to really interrogate the, today's spending review from various different directions. And you'll know that at class, we take real pride in ensuring that we're always thinking about the impacts on everyday people, but always including considerations for what it means for, for workers, um, and in particular, take an intersectional approach to everything that we do. Um, it really is, or should be at least a, a big day in UK history and economic history. We heard today confirmed news of the biggest cut in economic output for 300 years, over 300 years. Um, that rather than a strong V-shaped recovery that some had hoped for um, and the Chancellor himself has spoken about, it does look like next year is going to be another year of slow growth, um, of poor job growth. Um, and so the economic impacts of the COVID crisis, um, at least in today's OBR, OBR's analysis, are going to be drawn out for some time. Today we needed a bold plan from the Chancellor. We didn't get that. Um, and we were, I mean, each of us will have a, a take on what particular area has frustrated us. Um, here at CLASS, we just put out a publication on what it will really take to level up, where we asked a number of experts, including some on the call today, Howard Reed and Prem, um, to look at how, uh, at what sorts of policies would need to be put in place for us to really level up. And it really did demonstrate to us that what Rishi Sunak has said today and, and the kind of general approach to date hasn't taken levelling up seriously. In fact, in lots of ways, we are seeing a levelling down of the UK. Um, we're seeing inequalities get worse. Today, we had an inc incoherent strategy around levelling up. So on the one hand, we heard about at a regional investment bank, which is something that many of us have argued for for a long time, although there will be the devil was in the detail. At the same time, we heard about a public sector pay freeze, which because of the composition of the workforce will impact um, the North and the Midlands more than the Southeast and London. And um, we heard about a leveling up fund, which barely even begins to cover what we are losing from EU uh, withdrawal of the EU, structural, EU structural funds and 40 years of underinvestment. And we heard about climate being a priority and yet we are seeing a record investment in road building. It was hugely incoherent. There were all kinds of issues. And, and for me, I think one of the cynical aspects of course was the cut to the aid budget, uh, really at a time of a global pandemic uh, to cut the budget, which would have shrunk in any case because it's 0.7% of GDP, to cut that to 0.5% really smacked of cynicism and of political point scoring, um, you know, far out from a general election. So, there, you know, for me, there's real, uh, a, a real um, sticking point there as well. So really, as I've said, really glad for us to have an um, incredible set lineup of speakers today. Um, where I've asked each of them, or we've asked each of them to give us a hot take, to take five to six minutes to really give us a hot take on what they make of the spending review today. Um, and um, we're going to try and take questions. So if you do have questions, please do start putting them in the Q&A um, uh, Q box, and I will pick up on them as we go along. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're, we're going to try and finish around between 6 and 6.15 at the latest. So um, yeah. Just, gonna, just to, to say to all speakers, I'm going to be strict on timing. I've mm -hmm. got my time already. Um, I'll start waving at you or interrupting um, uh, just before six minutes. So I'm going to kick off with Howard Reeds, uh, who's at La who runs Landman, uh, Landman Economics, and who wrote a paper for us on wages uh, in the Leveling Up paper. Thanks, thanks, Fi thanks, Fiza. Well, uh, the main thing I'm going to talk about is wages and the impact of the public sector pay freeze um now this is this was kind of trialed in the media as a public sector pay freeze across the board except for nhs workers nhs workers are, uh, workers are excluded from the freeze and there's also going to be at least 250 pounds for workers earning less than 24,000 pounds a year uh now for somebody earning 24,000 pounds a year that is still only a one percent increase or just over so still a real terms cut 
Um, so while it's not a full pay freeze across the board, it's still a kind of kick in the teeth for a large proportion of public sector workers um, who have already endured a decade of um, conservative and coalition governments where their wages were mostly frozen in real terms. If you look at the data on uh, median full time wages for public sector workers in the annual survey of hours and earnings, you, you see um, over the 20, well, since 2011, public sector wages have fallen by an average of 2% in real terms. That's compared to a 7% growth for the equivalent group in the private sector. So this is, um, if you like, this is a partial return to the failed austerity policies of the 2010s, the George Osborne policy. This is kind of austerity light, if you like. And the in the context of a debt to GDP ratio, which is approaching 110% now, the savings from this policy probably about 0.3% of GDP a year. I mean, they're, they're, they're tiny savings um, for, for something that's going to have a big impact on public sector workers. It's going to depress demand, uh, which may well hold back uh, and impair the recovery from COVID-19. Um, that's certainly what happened in the recovery from, recovery from the previous 2008-09 banking crisis. Um, in the 2010s, in the decade we just had, GDP per head grew more slowly than in any decade in the post-war period. And we are basically returning to a kind of light version of those failed policies. Um, the other two things I'll talk about, there, there is some welcome increase in capital investment in particular. But um, what we've seen from this government in terms of crony capitalism, um, you know, uh, PPE contracts handed out to conservative donors, 22 billion allocated this year for a test and trace system that doesn't even work properly. Um, and the four billion pound of local infrastructure, the levelling up fund. Now that's going to be spent on projects that are agreed with MPs, uh, constituency MPs. And the danger is that just gets used like the towns fund that was announced previously, that just gets used for projects in conservative marginals to shore up the Tory vote. So this, this whole kind of feel of cronyism about what the government's doing is very worrying, I think. The final thing I'll talk about is the overall kind of panic in some quarters. Certain BBC journalists have been getting very upset about the level of debt, saying, using the old George Osborne lines, we've maxed out the credit card, there's no money left. I mean, it's just a nonsense. Um, if you look at the OBR's own figures, the cost of debt servicing is less than 2% of GDP. That's the cost of the interest that the government pays on its current debt. So it's about 2% or less than 2%. In the 1990s, that cost was about 25 to 3% of GDP. Um, so we're going to peak at the moment at about 100%, sorry, 110% of GDP debt in the, in the central scenario. We could probably go up to about 150% at least. Uh, debt to GDP ratio without paying anything more as a proportion of GDP than we were paying in the 1990s. So there's plenty of headroom for additional spending. That's why the government's been able to announce, you know, uh, 16 billion extra for defence, extra money for the NHS. Um, but, you know, there should have been additional money for public sector workers um, if the government was being consistent across the board. And anybody who says there's no money for additional spending in this context is either being economically illiterate or is scaremongering for political reasons and quite possibly both um so overall i think i'll leave it there that so so i mean the best i can say about the spending review today is it could have been worse um but it's really mixes a partial return to failed austerity politics of the 2010s but with an added overlay of cronyism so uh, a lot to be worried about i think Thanks for that overview, Howard. Really great introduction. Uh, that kind of mixing. It is a it is a bit of a Frankenstein of economic policies and policies put together. Because on the one hand, um, uh, you can talk about the ten point green plan, and I'm sure Clive will pick up on that. Though, which isn't enough money, which is something. But on the other hand, it's increase in military spending. So it is a, it is a very different set of policies, albeit some aspects of the Osborne era have, have come over. Um, the, I don't know what the word would be for Osborne economics now, what is it, Sunak economics? I don't know, um, we'll see what that means. Um, 
So really pleased to have Dr. Marianne Stevenson uh, join us from the Women's Budget Group. Um, I've worked with her in various different ways and on the Women's Budget Group Commission, which reported this year and really did a lot to highlight the ways in which we can build a care-led recovery and a care-led uh, economy. So Marianne, tell us, was this budget good for women? Um. No, not particularly. Um, thank you, Pfizer. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'd just like to follow up what Howard said, actually, about this um, obsession with the um, sort of fear mongering around the levels of debt in particular. And one of the things that the Chancellor said, which was about, um, you know, highest level of post-war debt. And it makes me think back to the end of the Second World War, where we equally had high levels of debt and we decided to create the welfare state. You know, it is not necessary um, to to focus to, to treat debt as something that that needs to be paid down. That what we need to be worrying about now is how do we pay for coronavirus. We actually need the same scale of ambition and vision that we had at the Second World War, where we say we don't want to go back to business as usual. The pandemic has exposed um, and exacerbated, you know, many of the pre the, the inequalities that many of us have been talking about for a long time. And this is an opportunity to set a change of direction and create the sort of economy and society that we want to see. Um, and that requires more spending, not less. Um, as Howard said, there was a focus on some infrastructure investing investment, but again, it was still investment in physical infrastructure. So it's still very much tied to this government's vision of build, build, build. Um, and at the Women's Budget Group, one of the things that we've highlighted is the need for investment in social infrastructure, particularly um, the care sector, um, which is in crisis, both health and, but both social care and childcare. Um, but we've also shown that you could create um, 2.7 times as many jobs from investment in care as the same amount of money invested in construction. So there's a missed opportunity here to actually deal with the high levels of unemployment that we're gonna face, both as a result of coronavirus, but also as a result of Brexit, which the Chancellor didn't say anything about at all. Um, and when you're thinking about uh, the, the state of British finances over the next few years, it's not just about the, the impact of COVID, it's about the impact of, of Brexit and the greater restrictions on trade that we're going to face. So there was some extra money for social care. Um, the one billion pounds announced last year has been extended into this year. There's an extra 300 million um, for local authorities and local authorities will also be able to raise additional money from um, uh, council tax. Um, but obviously money from council tax uh, disadvantages poorer local authorities because they can raise less money because the people in those areas are poorer and none of this actually touches the sides of the crisis that we're facing in social care um, and the need for greater investment in social care. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was the failure to um, continue the uplift in universal credit. Now I know that spending reviews don't generally deal with um, social security, but we are in unusual times and this would seem to be an ideal opportunity for the chancellor to reassure those people who are claiming universal credit that that additional 20 pounds a week, which um, is, is not a huge amount, but is massively significant in a lot of people's budgets when money is tight, will continue um, into next financial year. Um, we also needed to see an uplift in the benefits that predate universal credit. So for a lot of disabled people, for example, among the groups that have been hit hardest by coronavirus, um, the, the UC uplift hasn't benefited them because they're claiming employment support allowance, um, and that wasn't uplifted in line with universal credit. Um, so there's a, there's a big gap there. Um, there's a gap around... Um, support for violence against women's services. You know, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, and we're still seeing uh, a violence against women's sector, particularly specialist by and for services for BME women, which have been hit first by austerity and then by increased demand as a result of COVID. We know that the lockdown has caused an increase in levels of violence and abuse. Um, and so this should have been a time to actually put more money into those services. And finally, I'd like to say something about the um, 
aid spending, because obviously the majority of the poorest people in the world are women. Um, and we're at a point when those, the, the poorest people in the world, the poorest women in the world need support more than ever. You know, we're all facing a global pandemic. We think things are tough in the UK. They're infinitely harder in many, many parts of the world. Um, and so the idea that that budget is going to be hit by a, a double whammy, as you said, Pfizer, not only is the, the percentage of GDP cut, but GDP overall is going to fall. So the amount of money um, for, for foreign aid is going to go down. And that's not just bad for the poorest people in the world. It's um, bad in terms of public health. You know, this is a global pandemic. We can't solve this problem with a kind of UK only solution. We actually need to think in terms of global solutions. Um, so that, again, there was a failure to kind of join the dots and think through, actually, this isn't just about um, tackling poverty. This is also about our own self-interests as well. Great. Thank you so much, Marianne. I just want to come back on a question that um, Heather Wakefield has, has asked um, about, and we were talking about this just before we started, that what does, because a lot of the social care workers, um, social care workers have been outsourced, um, does it mean that they, what does this mean for them today? So obviously the public sector pay freeze wouldn't affect them, no. but what are the chances of them getting a pay rise? Well, those outsourced. large numbers of public sector workers are on kind of minimum wage um, uh, levels anyway so the increase in the, the national living wage will benefit that those people um, uh, but no I mean there's there's no guarantee of a pay rise for care workers um, and we know that the care sector is in crisis I mean we know that um, there are falling um, occupation levels within um, care homes, for example. Um, and we know that one of the ways in which care homes survive is that they are able to cross subsidize the low levels of support they get from local authorities because of the cut to local authority budget, which doesn't actually cover the cost of care for those people who are publicly funded. So those costs are met by cross subsidy from um, private residents. Now, obviously, if you have a fall in people going into social care, not surprisingly at the moment, because people will be doing everything they can to keep themselves and their loved ones out of care homes, um, that is going to have an impact on the care sector. And because of the way the care sector is structured um, and uh, the, the kind of reliance on uh, private care provision, um, we are going to see failures in care home chains, which is going to have a devastating impact on the people receiving care, on the workers in the care sector, and on the people who will have to pick up the pieces by increasing the level of unpaid care they provide. And again, that's most likely to be women. Yeah, that's sobering um, analysis there, Marianne. Thank you. Um, just to come back to you, Howard, just on this question um, from Tom T. Um, so unemployment is, of course, forecast to increase. Um, how, like, is, do we have any indication of where that increase will in occur um, by occupations or sectors or ge geographically? Well, there's short and the short and long run effects may be different. I mean, in the short run, uh, a lot of the big hits are hospitality, things like aviation sector, the ones that were you know, took a big hit from the early months of the pandemic and that's where the the big um, that's where the most furlough has been in terms of percentage of the workforce and now unemployment um in the longer run it may be a more generalized thing i mean we may well see um redundancies in the public sector as well as the private sector it could be it could be more of a kind of shake out uh more across the board um, and it's actually quite hard to predict. I mean, OBR's one interesting thing is OBR's forecast that they that they came up with this uh, for this uh, spending reviewer qu look quite different from their July forecasts. They're, they're, they're now um, they're now looking at a, a slightly lower peak in unemployment, but for longer, right? Uh, so it's kind of hard to say at the moment. I, I I would say because this is such a this is such a different event from anything we've faced before in our lifetimes, the actual, you know, the impact of the pandemic. So it's hard to say, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do know though that young people have been especially affected. Um, and I think one of the big 
concerns that the unions have um, is that more people will end up being on zero hour contracts and insecure contracts, uh, short term contracts, because as well as you know, genuine um, uh, inability to, uh, to really forecast demand for some businesses, some businesses are using this as an opportunity to do the sorts of things that they wanted to do anyway. So British Airways is a really good example of this where for a long time they've wanted to level down um, workers' rights and they've now really pushing this kind of fire and then rehire on new terms. So um, there, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disputes going on. I know the unions are very busy in trying to defend even the existing rights uh, and contracts uh, that workers have. Um, so, and I just, it just struck me there, Marianne, when you were talking that we heard a lot about building back better but today was wholly underwhelming in that respect um, it really isn't about building back better um, and you know really not being ambitious when it comes to doing things like the found on the foundational economy on on the care sector and um, thinking bold thinking ambitiously at this really important juncture in UK history um, on that I want to come to Clive Clive is already um, Clive Lewis, who's uh, obviously everyone will know, Clive needs no introduction. Um, uh, there's already a number of questions coming through on the Q&A about Labour's response to this, but I'll, I'll come back to you on some of that. But do you want to just talk us through your hot take on the spending review today? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Faiz. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk very quickly on, on debt, on the issue of debt, and a little bit on levelling up and the green investment um, that's been talked about today. So I, I think if we look at the Chancellor's quote, the situation on underlying debt and borrowing figures is clearly unsustainable in the medium term. And then the comments that have been discussed by some of the speakers already about uh, the, the, the kind of BBC, the media going apoplectic about this issue, about maxing out on the credit card, you can already see that the frame is being set for this uh, approach. And I've seen it on social media today. I've been attacked for talking about public sector pay cuts, about well, where are we going to find the money? And I think the Labour Party has to challenge this creeping narrative about debt. Um, we can't afford to make the same mistake we made 10 years ago after the 2008 crash. We've got to go on the front foot on this. And that means taking this head on and acknowledging that when the private sector, when private households uh, and the economy is shrinking, this is when the government has to step up and step in. Uh, and invest and you know look you'll see from the, the figures today i think has already been touched on that the cost of borrowing uh, is, is something like uh, i think it's 20 billion less um uh, than it was uh, a little period ago so you can already, and that's where some of the money has been found for other spending commitments so the the cost of borrowing is at an all-time record low because interest rates are so low um the reset report that we came out with on the green new deal group which was uh, the all-party parliamentary group on the Green New Deal set up something um, during the COVID pandemic called Reset. But we did a major piece of investigatory work talking to tens of thousands of people. We had social anthropologists on board trying to get an idea about what people wanted to come off out of the pandemic, how they wanted to see things change. Um, and one of the things that one of the policy kind of pieces that came back was that at a time of economic downturn, um, what we got back from the investigation, from the people that we spoke to, that the, the experts and others, was that national government remains the only institution capable and large enough uh, to lead a program of economic transformation. And that's by borrowing to invest. Um, you know, we saw that under the last Labour leadership. I, we've seen uh, this uh, leadership under Keir begin to touch on that with the Green Recovery Program, which we'll perhaps touch on in a second. We need to put that front and centre far more. £30 billion pounds is far more than the £4 billion pounds of new uh, green investment spending that the government has announced. I think the total is £12 billion, but a lot of that is rehashed. £4 billion is pretty much the, is the new spending. That's nowhere near where France and Germany are. And whilst £30 billion is good, I think given the scale of the crisis, given how much we've spent on COVID, you can see how much is possible to spend uh, given the existential threat of the climate crisis and how instrumental that could be in rebuilding our economy from this potential recession in a more sustainable way, building back better, not simply a recovery as to where we were before, going back down that path. I think the other thing as well is quantitative easing. I mean, I don't want to go into, <laughs> don't enter into the realms of MMT. I don't think we have to. I think the reality 
of where we are already is that the government has already turned to the Bank of England to inject via quantitative easing 350 billion pounds of electronic money into the economy to cover COVID costs. And I think what politicians and uh, political activists of all persuasions need to grasp is that this mechanism requires no extra demands on taxpayers or increased government borrowing. And, and in the past decade of its use, it has not resulted in rising inflation. Perhaps we can discuss that today, but I think we need to basically move away from this issue of um, uh, the economy um, being like a, a private sector household. And we have to challenge that. We have to challenge it robustly now. Um, on leveling up public sector pay freezes, we've discussed that um, already. The reset report, and I'm going to keep on going on about this because it's a major piece of work that I think needs to be kind of shouted out about as much as possible. Um, we suggested a minimum income guarantee as opposed by the New Economics Foundation or some form of universal basic income, uh, a pilot of which has already been backed by 500 politicians from around the UK. We also looked at a guaranteed uh, employment and a universal basic income also received strong support. We, we, we also found that two thirds of people um, are in favour of a jobs guarantee with a 9% comparatively opposed and 57% support some form of monthly guaranteed income. I'll come very briefly on to the 0.7% uh, the A commitment. I mean, you know, look, when we talk about a just transition, so often we talk about a just transition for British workers, okay? And of course, they should be front and centre of any policy uh, that the Labour movement puts forward. But I'm afraid to say there is going to be no trans just transition or no successful fight against the climate crisis unless that just transition is an international just transition. And that means there are going to have to be some tough decisions uh, from the global north on how we're going to support the global south who haven't done the historic, uh, historic carbon emissions and who do need to grow their economies. Unlike us, in some ways, there are other ways that we can sustainably expand our economies, if that's the way you want to describe it. But they really do need that room and that space and that ability to do that. And I think this 0.7 aid, um, this 0.7%, this cut to um, spend spending from 0.7% of GDP is tragic. Given the year that we are meant to be heading up COP26, leading the way uh, from the uh, you know, G20 countries and how we're going to tackle the climate crisis, this is money that we should be increasing not decreasing. And I think where the Labour Party now needs to go is if you're going to defend something, you know, you need to defend, I think, a good offence is the best defence. We shouldn't be defending 0.7%. We should be calling for more than 0.7%. Off the back of a global pandemic, a global downturn with hundreds of millions, if not billions of people falling uh, further into poverty um, and those economies falling further behind, now is the time for us to say, this is the year of global leadership. Let's go forward and I go further than 0.7%. Uh, ring fence it, you know, in terms of decarbonisation, sustainability objectives. But nonetheless, I think the Labour Party needs to go further than it currently is. My fear is that we're thinking we're worrying about our swing, swing voters in the red wall seats and that this is going to go down well with them. I bet your bottom dollar uh, that I thought Rishi Sunak looked deeply uncomfortable today. I think this has come from number 10 and I think this is something where they know that this is going to be uncomfortable for Labour because it sits right in that culture war where the Tory party like to operate. And they know that in that fight for those so-called Tory swing votes in the red wall seats, uh, this is red meat. And they know that Labour are going to struggle to be able to compete with them, where they are quite happy uh, to do things like this. I think I I'll, I'll finish on the green investment. I think the National Infrastructure Bank, the devil's going to be in the detail. Uh, and how net zero will feature in the bank's remit. We heard nothing on that. That has to be a, a big part of that. Labour's already called for a national investment bank. That policy is now standard. Um, I think uh, many small businesses experience difficulties accessing government schemes, uh, in part because the UK doesn't have uh, a local banking service that can respond to those needs. Um, and I think for the Labour Party generally on the green investment side of things, I think we can still step up further. And I think we have to put that front and centre about how we will re rebuild our economy, not going back to where we were, but moving forwards. Now, that is problematic in areas like aviation. I, I, I have to admit, I'm struggling to get behind the campaigns to save aviation in its current format. Um, I, I think we should be talking more about a just transition for those workers into new sectors, into more sustainable sectors. To be quite frank, um, the aviation industry is one of the, you know, the, the biggest contributors uh, to carbon and pollution 
uh, that we've got. And I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. And I think we can be brave and bold and say, this, and this is an opportunity for us now to support that sector, but not through handouts to British Airways and others, where I think ultimately this is, tw this is the 20th century business model. We now need to be thinking about the 21st. So um, lots of different things to think about and discuss. Great, thanks, Clive. And just just on that last point, I think one of the things that Unite and other unions are asking for from um, from the government on British Airways and aviation is to um, to give them money, but to say that they also need to that if they're only going to get this money if they're going to make those green transitions and and do that um, quickly. Um, Clive, I just want to come back to you. I think one of the questions that that is coming up in one way or another on this Q and A is what really what's the difference between putting aside your own views, what's the difference between what Labour is offering right now and what Sunak is saying today? What would you say are the headline um, policies or particular areas of um, disagreement? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I, would say, I would say obviously the scale of the green recovery. Sorry, uh, am I on? Yeah, sorry, the scale of the green recovery. Um, you know, the Tories, four billion pounds of new money as part of the 12 billion pounds uh, green industrial revolution. Labour uh, is looking at thirty billion pounds, uh, thirty billion pounds investment um, to rebuild businesses, retrain workers, recover jobs, um, invest in, in the sustainable economy. So I think there's a major difference there. Uh, I don't think we go far enough. I think we can be bolder, but there's a difference there. Clearly, we're not calling for a cut uh, to foreign aid, and we're not calling for a cut uh, mm -hmm. to public service uh, to public sector uh, workers' pay. I think we'll welcome. Um, the, uh, the the increases to um, the uh, to to the put to the lowest paid workers in terms of the government's minimum wage. It's not called it a living wage; it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. But again, we can go further. So I mean, just off the top of my head, those are what I would say mm -hmm. the main the main differences. And just one more thing that's coming up on this and, and building on what Howard said earlier is around the the corruption. And we heard Annalise Dodds go very strongly on government waste, the chumocracy. As they've called it, also known as uh, corruption. Um, and so I just wondered, as what you think from a kind of Labour perspective, is that going to be a big push now to really highlight the ways in which the Tories are giving their friends contracts? Um, if there's some narrative be narrative work being done around that, um, and if if you get the sense that that's going to be a really key part of the messaging going forward, and if you think it should be, yeah, yeah. Look, I I do think it should be. I think we have to be careful though that. If we, unless you have uh, a viable, unless you are going to suggest something which is, I think, viably and, and quite fundamentally different to the, uh, the, the, the contracts that are being given out, the procurement contracts that are being given out, where we are at the moment as a party is what we're saying is, and we do seem to have shifted um, from uh, the last leadership, is we just seem to be saying that we want greater transparency for those public procurement contracts. And I kind of think the Tories' response to this, you heard it from Boris Johnson on PMQ today, was basically Labour hates the private sector, um, which is, is clearly rubbish. Um, but I kind of feel to myself, if you're going to offer an alternative vision, is how do you move away from a system of procurement which allow, which I think is fundamentally broken anyway, but what are you offering that's different? Are you just simply saying you want more transparency? Uh, you, you, you want, I, I just think that if, you know, the procurement process in this country has to date, I think, you know, seen contracts go overseas, it's seen corruption. I think Labour needs to be saying that there is a fundamentally better way of providing public services uh, and public goods. And, you know, we can think of 21st century ways of doing that, but there needs to be, I think, a bigger public involvement rather than just simply saying we need a more efficient public procurement system. To me, if you're going to go heavy on, on the procurement issue, you need something fundamentally different, a different vision, a better vision, uh, a modern 21st century vision, which puts you know, public needs front and centre, if you're going to do that. Otherwise, it's like angels on the head of a pin, I think, personally. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Clive. Yeah, that, I think that's a really important point about needing to offer an alternative. And I think this is a Good point to bring in Prem Sikha, who is a great friend of class and, and the left more generally. He's a professor in accounting. He's Lord Prem Sikha now, so um, is, is even more busy than he ever was. Um, Prem, give us a little bit of a take on maybe some of what Clive said, but also on what we heard or didn't hear in terms of tax uh, today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. 
the chancellor actually said uh, very little directly about tax, though there are some hidden measures there. For example, as already been indicated, uh, the care, care homes are not being adequately supported. So local council tax would increase by 3%. Uh, basically to fund care homes. The 5% on VAT, the 5% uh, VAT on hospitality ends in January. The VAT on PPE has already increased this month. But the related documentation published by the Treasury, in a sense, also shows us how some of our taxes have been spent. I picked out a couple of items. For example, the eat out, do you remember we were all told we got to rush down to the restaurants and eat? That has cost 840 million pounds. Now, has it really produced the results which were expected or did it really spread COVID? Uh, the jury may be out. Nearly 12 billion pounds has been given in business rates holidays. And I question that. I doubt whether banks and supermarkets and many other businesses actually needed any of it because they have been absolutely thriving uh, while their competition has been uh, suffering. Uh, but the chancellor did not uh, announce any desire to claw any of that back. Indeed, we don't even know the list of the companies who've been given. Uh, uh, this business rates holiday to what what the value of this is to them or the value of the job retention scheme or the furlough, star, furlough staff scheme subsidies. I've asked questions about that in Parliament and uh, seem to get a no-no answer. That's the usual kind of response they give in Parliament. So, so that really provides us a kind of a snippet the other thing is, which is completely missing really from the Chancellor's announcement, is any notion of redistribution. We entered this pandemic in a pretty bad state. And indeed, it was the people on poorest wage, the lowest wage, who died uh, serving the rest of us. So there's no hint of any redistribution at all in what the government uh, is doing. And it had the opportunity to, re to redistribute, for example, if a, a one tax relief, which has been mentioned quite a lot in the press. Last year, the government gave 38 billion pound in uh, tax relief on pension contributions. Most of that goes to the higher and additional rate taxpayers. There are one and a half million workers who earn less than 12 and a half thousand pound a year and they're getting absolutely no tax relief on auto enrollment into pension schemes. The, the government has not sought to correct that in any way whatsoever. And if it, if it standardized the tax relief at the rate of 20%, that would have left 11 billion pounds spare, which could have been redistributed. For example, uh, providing uh, better childcare, uh, providing uh, free school meals, uh, uh, even in secondary schools and uh, where, where children are going hungry. It could have provided uh, subsidized transport for the younger people, but absolutely no attention has been paid. That is just one thing. The government is giving about 1,134, I think it is off the top of my head, tax reliefs, and it doesn't even know what their value is and whether they actually generate any of the assumed economic benefits. Film industry gets a lot of tax reliefs, but recently been reported that the makers of James Bond films since the 60s have hardly paid any tax. So the government could have gone after tax avoiders. HMRC's own statistics tell us that in the last decade, it failed to collect over 300 billion pound of taxes due to avoidance, evasion, errors, and other reasons. I don't believe the HMRC model. The alternative models suggest it is somewhere between 58 billion and possibly 122 billion pound a year. That means up to 1,200 billion pound of taxes not collected. Well, you don't need to be a genius to say, well, you really got to go after that pot. But the government has said absolutely nothing about it today. And even his previous attempts have not really been that uh, successful. Maybe another time I could uh, uh, talk about more, more uh, uh, of that. 
So the government had said absolutely nothing about gender and ethnicity pay gap, because earlier we heard talk about uh, 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 how some of the people on the lower, on the on, on low wages may get a higher uh, increase because of, next year because of the increase in the minimum wage. But what about the gender and ethnicity pay gap? That is not really being addressed. It is quite, it, it was quite, it would have been quite easy for Chancellor to say how he's going to penalize employers who have not really addressed that issue. And that could have again increased people's purchasing power. So if we want economic recovery, what we have to do is increase the purchasing power of the masses. And you can either put more money in their pocket or you can uh, provide services, which at the moment are not really av uh, available to them. We didn't really get any sense of that. We have 14 million people living below the poverty line. And that includes children and uh, retirees. Last year, 3 million people were estimated to have been treated for malnourishment. 1.3 million of that are over 65s. That is a disgraceful statistic in the world's sixth richest economy. But the government has paid absolutely no attention to uh, issues about redistribution. So we also needed a bolder uh, kind of a vision about rebuilding the economy. We need new industries. Green industries are one thing. There's issues about artificial intelligence. We need to rebuild manufacturing. So what has PPE told us? That this country's economy is in, in such a state that we can't even produce the basic face masks and ventilators. We have to import them from China. Uh, well, it doesn't take a genius to say, well, that could easily be produced at home. But the government's made absolutely no attempt to restructure the economy. And I searched in vain since Rishi Sunak spoke uh, for any kind of a coherent industrial strategy. Basically don't see any. So people ine inevitably say, how is it going to be funded? Quantitative easing has already been mentioned, and we must pay attention to MMT as well. The borrowing is a pretty low, at a low cost at the moment. In the late 1940s, around about 1950, the Sorry, can you uh, that, borrowing, please? yeah, the debt was about 250% of GDP. Well, as has been mentioned earlier, we actually launched a welfare state to address that. So we haven't really got a bold vision of that kind. So maybe in the later discussion, I can give you other examples of how we can raise literally billions and billions of tax revenues, whether it is from financial transaction tax, wealth tax, inequality tax, and many others, if the political will is there. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Prem, for that. And just to say some of that detail of what Prem has just said is in the essay he wrote for us in the What, what It Will Take to Level Up report. Um, so definitely worth having a look at that. It did strike me when you spoke about the tax as aspect. Um, I saw an article yesterday in The Guardian that said that Amazon sales have gone up by 35% and yet the increase in uh, money paid is just 3% um, in taxes. Um, and of course, we know there's various issues with how much they pay their workers and how they treat them. Um, and so today we had a kind of populist move on the aid budget. And um, it, does it feel like actively not doing a move on taxes, on taxes on some of these big companies that would be hugely popular with the public? Um, I just wondered if you wanted to say something on, on that in the Amazon point in particular. And I just want to say that, so I'm going to start doing this international project where we're looking at um, a number of countries who want to introduce some sort of solidarity tax, no noting that this year people have realized the importance of low paid workers um, and this as an opportunity to do something about inequality. And I guess my fear is here, are we really missing the opportunity whilst people spend you know, months going out and clapping, have we just missed an opportunity to do something about redistribution? Is that what we heard today, that they're not interested in redistribution? Well, it certainly was not in the Chancellor's vocabulary. As regard taxes, uh, it is very, I mean, we, you know, first thing is we need to know how the companies are dodging taxes. And in the last Labour manifesto, one of the great proposals was 
that all large companies sh should be required to file their tax returns at company's house together with an explanation of any avoidance schemes which they have used. So that let every citizen become an auditor. And if we find the companies are cheating, we simply don't buy their services. At the moment, I look at the accounts of companies like uh, Amazon, it is almost impossible to tell what their actual profit is because the accounts are incredibly opaque and you really need to look at hundreds of companies anyway to make sense of it. So, you know, we need to mobilize people to, and also the laws to add transparency. And we need to reform the corporation tax system, which is actually broken. You know, it was designed a hundred years ago. It is unfit for purpose. Thank you for that, Prem. I'm sure um, everyone would agree with you that on, on that. Um, Maurice, I know you're having some issues because you're traveling. Are you able to speak? Oh, I can't hear anything. I think that's I think that's probably a no for now. All right, I'm gonna take some questions and hopefully um Maurice, let us know when you when you're somewhere where we, we just couldn't hear you at all. Um I can just about I just saw you for a second, but we just couldn't hear you. If you just want to text Raquel or Lester when you can speak and I'll, I'll bring you in because it'd be good to get your thoughts. Um, so I'm just going to go through some questions and I'm just going to give um, Howard, Clive, Prem, um, Marianne an opportunity just to come back on some of them. We've spoken a little bit about a few of these uh, a few of these issues. I, I wonder if anyone can pick up on this question from Sonia on what the spending review means for health services and health of the nation more generally. Um, obviously they, they did protect NHS workers today in part because they know that people would have kicked off, but um, just wondered if, I, I don't know if Howard and Marianne, if you looked at this part of it, if you were able to say anything on that. Um, I guess the, the sort of a general point about really like ideologically, the Tories have never been interested in redistribution. So, I mean, how far can we really expect them to go um, and what your fears are, looking at today, looking at what you've seen so far this year, what your fears are around um, the policies that are being put in place. Um, and then, um, just, I guess, and another thing that keeps coming up is, a, is the narrative point. I think a lot of people on the left are fed up of um, us not making um, the points around around debt and really being actively pushing that away. Um, what are what would each of you say um, to commentators or what you're doing in your own work to make sure that we really finally, after ten years, get somewhere in um, rebutting these misleading arguments away uh, about public debt and public borrowing? And just to say on that, when um, Laura Kunzberg and other journalists have been coming out today and saying the usual points about um, maxing out the credit card and the rest of it, which is obviously wholly wrong. Um, I know a number of people have already written in uh, complaints, complained to BBC and complained to Politics Live specifically, and we have to do that because um, it's not a public service to mislead people on how the economy works. So that's one thing that I know I'm going to do as well uh, at the end of this session is to just write a complaint to BBC and say that this is not on. But um, yeah, let me come back to you, Howard, on some of that, if you want to pick up some of those questions. Yeah, certainly. Um, on health spending. Now, um, in the in historical in the historical context, the longer run historical context, although um, health is seeing real terms increases in spending, uh, we're told they will not be bigging that they will they will still it, the, the settlement will still be fairly tight by historical standards and of course the um the the increased kind of burden on health services of covid in particular as well as other things like the aging population um increased disability all kinds of things but but we know from, from we don't know that much about COVID yet because it's very new, but we know that there's a lot of instances of long COVID of people requiring, you know, um, ongoing care for for several years potentially, or you know, possibly in some cases for the rest of their lives. This is going to increase additional costs on the health, impose additional costs in terms of healthcare in the NHS. And I don't think the government's really responded to that at all, really. So, so, and I think that's something that you know, this government or you know, future governments will need to look at going forward. Um, 
in terms of the Tory appetite for redistribution, well, this whole levelling up agenda, although the report that Glass have uh, published shows that levelling up is a bit of a, a, a is a fantasy so far. I mean, you could have levelling up, levelling up, but you'd need very different policies from what the government's chosen to do so far. I mean, it is nonetheless the case that the Tory majority is quite uh, reliant. That eighty seat majority, a lot of those seats are kind of North and Midlands seats. I don't like the term red wall but it is you know it's it, it's a kind of seats with a lot of deprivation a lot of kind of low to middle income voters and if if the government is going to address the concerns of those voters they're either going to have to redistribute or they're going to have to move the debate on to some other non-economic um issue or like culture war type issue and they, at the moment they're choosing to do the latter but um you know that does leave space for Labour uh, to make the economic arguments about you know this, this the, the the government isn't redistributing and uh, you know you're worse off as a result you know in in four years time. Um, finally, in terms of making the economic arguments, I mean we know we kind of know what to say. It's just a question of getting it across. We know that the government budget is not like a household budget. We know that there's no real reason to be concerned about the level of debt at the moment in fact we should be borrowing more than we are really to, to, to sort of rebuild the economy um, I think it's just a question of getting the message out to alternative media outlets I mean uh, even some of the mainstream media sometimes the Guardian's quite good on this sometimes you get somebody good in the FT on it but things like you know uh, Byline Times, Open Democracy, Navara Media, all those outlets are out there. So, you know, make sure that you read them, uh, support them financially if you can. Um, and let's, you know, let, let's kind of overturn the kind of right wing uh, sort of uh, establishment media networks. I think that's the way forward. Really. Thanks, Howard. That's some ambition for you. And certainly if we're, if we're looking at how to change things, ultimately, we need to do something about the way in which this country's press works. Maurice, are you ready to, to, to come in? See you for a second there. I think technology is failing us, Maurice. We can't hear you at all. What a shame. Let me just direct everyone to, um, it was, we were really happy that you were gonna join us. It's a shame, but Maurice McLeod is the director of Rota and he was gonna talk to us about um, it was sort of inequality, the spending review and what's going on in terms of leveling up on on race. He's written a great chapter in the class report, what it will really take to level up. So you can have a look at that. I don't know, Maurice. Okay, well, thank you so much. But everyone, you can look at his comments. Um, let me come back to um, you, Clive, just, just to pick up on, on, on where Howard left us and on some of those questions about really what we can expect from the Tories and if they really are gonna redistribute and what your fears are going forward and what, what Labour can be fighting for at this point. Well, yeah, look, I think, look, obviously, you know, my chapter in your, in your, in your book is on radical democracy and, and radical changes and reform. And that's I think our next publication, Clive. Oh, that's, the, that's the next publication, sorry, I'm, I've, I've got the wrong away. one. Yeah. Sorry. But, you know, I always bang on about this, but, you know, there is a crisis of democracy and it, it, it manifests in various ways, the climate crisis being the least of them. But, you know, you can see here in our electoral system, the tyranny of the swing voter. So there are about a million people in this country. It's a shrinking number of, of, of constituencies and voters who are basically dictating, um, you know, the political narrative. And, and um, you know, at the moment, it does look like the Labour Party is, is responding to that rather than going to the root cause of why those small number of voters uh, have such a disproportionate uh, ability to, to dictate what, what's considered as politically important and what's acceptable and what's not. And, and I think we have to address that fundamental root cause. Uh, and unless we do, we will forever be going around in circles on this because that allows those million people to be, you know, manipulated by a right wing uh, mainstream media and also, you know, civil society, which this government still has a, a kind of hegemonic control, hegemonic position in. I mean, when you look at those, I think you know, one of the things that we can do is it's great that there's now a burgeoning kind of left of centre uh, media ecosystem, but we also need to be reaching out to people who aren't in that ecosystem. Otherwise, we're we're, we're preaching to the choir, and and that requires us basically making sure that. 
um, BBC journalists like Laura Kusenberg and others um, really understand that they're not going to get away with these, with, I'm afraid to say, tropes on the economy, that they are going to be challenged, that they are going to be ridiculed, because that, that isn't a mainstream view anymore. They're, they're out of date. And so I think there is a, you know, <laughs> to use Gramsci, a war of position where we need to build those hegemonic positions where this becomes a common sense. And I think that it's ripe. We're no longer where we were in 2010. It's ripe to do that. Um, some of the stuff that I'm looking to do in the future is to, is to, is to work with other organizations. There are a number of them out there to start thinking about how, I mean, if you remember NEOM, I think one of the things that happened under Jeremy and John over the last five years, before that period, there were all these outriders that were going out into the media organized by New Economics Foundation, NEON. I think you may well have been uh, one of them, Pfizer, who were going out and basically re-educating, moving the debate on about you know, economic education. And um, that, I think, stopped or dwindled away once we had a, a kind of left leadership, which were doing a lot of those things, talking about a lot of those things. That needs to be refired up. That needs to come back and it needs to come back with an urgency. Um, I think the other thing I would say is, you know, it's really clear to me that COVID presented an opportunity for our party and for progressives generally. The notion of Tina, there is no alternative, has been smashed out of the park by COVID. You know, people understand that there is a different way of living. Um, millions more people now understand that, you know, when the economic system as was stops, you know, the world didn't come crashing down. The magic money tree found money. You know, all of these, all of these factors where people are like, well, you know, this, is, this is such a different way of living. Government can find the money to do the things that we need to do. And I think there is a, 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 a real opportunity now for us in the Labour Party to get ahead of the curve. The public are ahead of us still. Uh, and I think what we can show is we don't have to go into detailed policies, but we can show a vision which shows people that there is a different way, that we understand that, we hear them, and that we're going to start to articulate that. At the moment, I just feel at the moment our comms is, 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 is still very narrowly formulated onto a small group of people that we're very worried about. The job of politics isn't to simply go where you think those people are. The job of politics is to convince others that what you're talking about, your vision, is, is going to be good for them and the right way forward. And I think that's what Labour needs to have a bit more, um, a little bit more confidence in doing. Thanks, Clive. That's great. And someone's put here, Richard um, has put that um, we need to call in those um, phone-in shows, whether they be on LBC or L others, uh, other places, Radio 5, etc., and put across these views um, and, and really try and push in um, what is right in any case, but just to push back on some of this neoliberalism, neoliberal economic thought and tropes um, in mainstream media. So I think that's a good idea. Can, um, can I just can I just say, Faisia, there's a question here. Hey, thanks to class for organising yeah, and the guests for taking part. part. Will Clive be taking place in the leadership yeah, contest? The only thing I'm running for at the moment is a bus. I just said that earlier on Twitter. That's the only thing you'll catch me running for in the next couple of weeks, a bus. So let's just put that one to bed. I'm not a stalking horse. I'm a backbench <laughs> Labour MP enjoying the freedom to speak my mind uh, within certain parameters. So, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I think that's just a sign <laughs> that they really enjoyed what you were saying, Clive. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. You know, we're massive fans of you here. Um, uh, I'm, Prem, I'll come to you then, Marianne. I'm going to give you the final words. Um, Prem, do you want to just just come back on on some of those points about kind of more broadly where we are and what what we can hope for over the next few years and what we need to be fighting for? Yeah, well, <clears throat> redistribution <clears throat> and uh, investment has to be a key part of rebuilding a society. We don't want to return to a pre-COVID society because that was the problem. We need to build a newer and a more equitable society. Let me just give you some figures. Earlier on, there was a little bit discussion about borrowing. In April 2010, the public debt, with all the problems about his measurements and his QE part of it or not, leaving that aside, in April 2010, it was 960 billion pounds. Just before COVID, February 2020, it was 1,791.5 billion. That's an increase of 831 billion pound in the age of austerity. Basically, government squandered it on tax cuts for corporations and the rich. 
hardly any new industries started. You know, they were giving ferry contracts to companies which had no ferries. And Boris Johnson was building garden bridges, which didn't lead anywhere. So, so there is that. Earlier on, there was also a point about jobs. It is a jobs emergency, especially for younger people. It can be easily addressed. Let us reduce the state pension age by one year. It has just been increased to 66. If we reduce it, those people who want to retire early can. That would free up jobs. Public sector should be taking up the slack. Boris Johnson has dared to compare himself to FDR. He's no FDR. He's no Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt. Uh, uh, FDR hired 10,000 oral historians. Because one of the problems the government has now, we don't actually know how people are living, what the effect of any government measurement, uh, government measures is on their daily lives. That is why so many people are living in poverty and in squalor. So FDR hired 10,000 people. They went around the country. They spoke to them, trying to find out what is happening to them. And that enabled him to build a lot of measures, including creating the SEC, the regulation, a modicum of social security and the state-owned industries and many other things. So those three measures are just indicated, give a ray of hope to many younger people, but that is not what is uh, happening. If, if anything, many of the poor are going to find a thousand pound a year cut in their budget because this 20 pound extra they got for universal credit will soon disappear. So what exactly are these people going to do? Uh, I, I just, you know, uh, I mean, if you don't listen to people, all you're opening up is the possibilities of kind of violence, okay? And that I think itself should concentrate politicians and the government's mind. We must redistribute, come what may. We must start new industries, especially in the regions which are depressed. So if you go look at the after the Second World War, industries like biotechnology, information technology, airlines, engineering, railways were decimated. Lots of the, the state invested in lots of these industries. They built it. So historically, if you like, the UK has been built collectively by the public and the private sector. What has now happened is for uh, quite a few years, the state has held back asking the private sector to take, uh, take, take the chances private sector never really had the appetite for newer risks. They want the governments to take those risks. And the same is kind of necessary again. We will not be able to start new industries without that. The, uh, earlier on, Clive mentioned the government's announcement about the infrastructure bank. Labor, you know, it's really borrowed from Labor's idea when they talked about a national investment bank. And there in 2017, Labor talked about 500 billion investment. Okay, now the government measure now amidst the crisis doesn't come anywhere near it. So we need to you know, pay attention to these things. Thank you so much for that, Prem. Um, and it is a reminder of, you know, pointing out that the social consequences of not getting this right. And certainly one of the things that was really missing today was a strategy about poverty eradication um, and on good quality, high paid jobs. And we know that's what it's really gonna take to level up. There's no leveling up with a little bit of um, regional funding here and there. You've got to do the, the real foundational stuff. Um, I want to end with Mary Ann. Do you want to give us the last two minutes of your thoughts? I mute myself. Brilliant. Um, no, I agree very much with a lot of what's been said already, particularly about the need for a vision that people can actually um, aspire to um, and and offering a clear alternative that, that resonates and makes sense. I think we also need to think about metaphors and images that we use. I mean, the reason the household budget analogy works, even though it's false, is because it makes sense to people. People understand an expression maxing out your credit card. People max out their credit cards all the time. Um, so we have to have um, metaphors and analogies that actually have that same resonance with people's everyday lives. Um, and I have to say that probably um, the right is often better at this 
you know, if you think about, you know, talking about inheritance tax as death tax, you know, there, there's a there's a way of, of thinking about words and language that works particularly well. And I think I very much agree with Clive that you know you need to get that those arguments into the mainstream media and into mainstream thinking. It it doesn't work to um, speak speak to converted and keep keep talking to ourselves. Um, but I do think it is very clear that people actually want change. And one of the things that we've seen over the months, I mean, there was the the um, the research that um, the uh, Clive's group did. We've done research with the Commission on a Gender Equal Economy, showing that people um, want more investment in care, more in, um, other public services, um, want to see a more generous social security system and are prepared to pay more tax for it, um, want to see a better sharing of care between women and men. Um, there was work that Tax Justice UK did on tax, which showed people's um, support for um, uh, pay, you know, higher levels of, of tax on wealth as well as tax on um, earnings. All of these sh things show that there is an appetite for change, but it needs to be focused um, by by a vision that actually that actually makes sense and, and speaks to the moment. And the reason that I keep coming back to the Second World War metaphor is that is one that works for people. People do actually understand the idea that coming out of crisis, you can create something brilliant and amazing. Um, and particularly the the sort of totemic importance of the NHS. You know, it's really noticeable that the the group of um, public sector workers that the government made great pay about protecting were NHS workers, because there is that understanding. It's partly because we're, you know, we're in a health crisis, but it's also because the NHS has a significance in a lot of people's lives that goes kind of beyond right and left. Um, and so actually thinking about what did the NHS come out of? Why was it created? It was created out of trying to create a uh, an alternative vision of a way of doing things, you know, a no turning back, a looking forward. Um, and I think that's that's what we need right now. Great, thank you so much for that, Marianne. I'm not gonna try and summarize all that we've heard today, but I think one of the clear messages coming out of this is that what we heard from Mr. Sunak today was it wasn't just that it wasn't enough in terms of money, but it was lacking in vision, it's lacking in, in wanting to address some of the issues most important at this time, equality, uh, climate crisis, the jobs crisis, poverty, um, it really fell short in all kinds of ways. Um, and so it's been great to have these voices today and really to get that sense of what we need to do going forward, which is to still argue for these radical, well, not even radical, these policies that make complete sense, that have huge amounts of public support and to make sure that we are pushing back as much as possible on um, the prevailing narrative about how public borrowing works. I um, just wanna say a quick thank you to Lester who, Lester, I don't know if you can, come on for a second. It's Lester's last day here at class today and he organizes our events and always does all the technical stuff and also does our comms and puts our reports Hi. together. <laughs> like, he's generally really awesome and an incredible uh, colleague. So I just wanted us to all to, um, for you to all to join me and thanking Lester so much. He's been with us for three years.